By the time Their Majesties King George VI and Queen Elizabeth visited Canada in the spring of 1939, war was no longer a threat. It was a dead certainty. The only question was, when? Despite the gathering war clouds, the royal visit of that year was an unqualified success. The presentation of the King's color by His Majesty provided an historic first for the Royal Canadian Navy. During the visit, Canadian destroyers served as constant escorts to the royal party. And upon his departure, the king sent a special signal of his appreciation to Skeena and Saguenay. Thank you for your escort. Goodbye and good luck. His Majesty's good wishes were timely, for Germany was now openly preparing for war. When war was declared on September 3rd, 1939, the mere knowledge that such giant ships as Bismarck existed would haunt Allied shipping in the North Atlantic. In August, German submarines, far deadlier than their primitive counterparts of the First World War, were leaving Kiel and Bremerhaven and taking up their war stations. of the German high seas fleet were battle ready and provided a formidable array of seagoing destructive power. Neisenau, Scharnhorst, Deutschland, Admiral Scheer, Graf Spee, Blücher, Admiral Hepper, Prince Eugen in an ever increasing bid for mastery of the seas. braced itself to meet the challenge. The stage was set for warfare on a scale never before experienced by mankind. On August 26, with the dispatch of the message funneled to intelligence centers around the world, all British shipping had passed into the control of the Admiralty. Simultaneously, the RCN assumed authority over ships of all registries in Canadian ports. The convoy system had begun. From the west coast to take up escort duties in the Atlantic came the destroyers Fraser and Saint Laurent. Skeena and Saguenay were already on the scene. These four ships were soon to be joined by Restigouche and Ottawa. Immediately, naval control officers assumed their function. The task facing them was enormous. Nothing less than the control of world trade. Vessels of every description would have to be formed into orderly fleets, sailed at precise times and by scheduled routes. 
skeptical and even resentful merchant seamen, by tradition an independent and spirited breed of men, would have to be welded into a disciplined organization. Halifax came to life with the grim vitality of a key port in a world at war. As in 1914, craft of all descriptions from luxurious yachts to austere fishing trawlers were bought or borrowed to meet the needs of the Navy. The organization of the great merchant fleets got underway. The first convoys began to set out. It was not clear in those early days what the role of the Canadian Navy would be in the struggle to come. There was little time to think of anything now except to prepare the ships for whatever lay ahead. On their first escort mission, Saint Laurent and Saguenay took convoy HX-1 out beyond the Halifax approaches, where the larger ships of the Royal Navy would take over. Fraser took her turn with the first of the so-called fast convoys. Skeena followed with convoy HX-2. On November 17th, the new Canadian destroyer Assiniboine arrived from the United Kingdom. She was on convoy duty the next day. Now, two convoys a week were sailing from Halifax. crossing was made under the watchful eye of a convoy commodore, usually a retired RN officer of flag rank. His was the responsibility for the discipline of the entire convoy. Not the least of the hazards which confronted the merchant ships and their escorts was the treacherous North Atlantic. The pounding sea exacted its toll in fatigue upon men and ships alike. boats waited. Their patrol line formed a chain of destruction from the north of Ireland to the coast of Portugal. All ships steaming in and out of the UK would have to pierce this barrier. During the first month of war, 40 ships totaling 150,000 tons, the victims of mine and torpedo, had gone down in the approaches to the United Kingdom. The elusive raiders of the German surface fleet and the deadly pocket battleships cast their threatening shadows over every Allied ship at sea. The toll taken of men and ships drove home the need for sailing under the protection of vigilant escorts. The convoy was no absolute guarantee of safe passage, but a slow merchantman proceeding alone was a sure invitation to disaster. By spring of 1940, the Allied forces suddenly found themselves with their backs to the sea. By June 1st, the evacuation of Dunkirk was at its peak. Thousands of beaten, battle-weary troops lined the coastal area of France waiting to be rescued. It is not known to this day exactly how many ships took part in Dunkirk, nor how many perished in the attempt.
With invasion and imminent threat, Canada was urged by the Admiralty to send every available ship to the United Kingdom. Skeena, Restigouche, and Saint Laurent arrived at Plymouth on June 1st. Fraser joined them two days later. These would be the first Canadians to engage the enemy. They would all fight bravely, and with the loss of Fraser on June 25th, some would die. Canada had begun to build ships to answer the need for escort vessels made more urgent by the loss of Fraser, Marguerite, and the crippling of Saguenay. Under the land lease program, seven destroyers were obtained from the United States Navy. Canada's share of 50 such vessels turned over to the Royal Navy. They were immediately put into service, for now Britain's very survival depended on the convoys getting through. Built for the warfare of another day, these American ships were lacking alike in effectiveness and comfort. The crowded quarters and the convulsive heavings of these ships in heavy seas tended to make life below decks a claustrophobic nightmare. For all their defects, they arrived at a crucial moment and saw valuable service throughout the war. The capture of the German merchant ship Weser by the armed merchant cruiser Prince Robert was the first of many successful actions by this converted luxury liner and her sister ships, Prince Henry and Prince David. The Prince ships were, until 1943, the heaviest units in the Canadian Navy. The Royal Navy, by 1941, had contained the German capital ships. Bismarck and Graf Spee had been destroyed, and Scharnhorst hugged the protection of the Norway coast. The threat of the surface raider in the Atlantic had lessened. Increasingly now, troop convoys carried Canadian Army personnel over to the United Kingdom for advanced training. Their objective? The ultimate invasion of the continent. As the Canadian shipbuilding program expanded, more and more corvettes and minesweepers began to move out of Canadian shipyards. The need was now more clearly than ever for seaworthy maneuverable anti-submarine vessels that could be produced quickly and in quantity. The corvette had demonstrated that it more than met these requirements. At the head of the Navy was Vice Admiral Percy W. Nellis, Chief of the Naval Staff. for men was as great as the need for ships. An accelerated recruiting program brought thousands of eager recruits into the shore establishments for basic training. But shore training was of necessity only a first tottering step toward seamanship. Their real training would begin at sea. To free men for sea duty, nearly 6,000 members of the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service took over shore-based responsibilities. The convoys continued to make the long, hazardous voyage across the Atlantic. At best, life aboard ship was uncomfortable and monotonous, and in winter, the story was often one of incredible hardship. The call to action stations could come at any time, day or night, winter or summer, fair weather or foul. statistics recorded the toll. Only one U-boat destroyed for every ten merchant ships lost. 
And for every ship being built in Allied shipyards, two sent to the bottom of the ocean. If the country owed a debt to the men and ships of the Navy, it owed an equal debt to those who manned the great merchant fleets. Men of every nationality, they went quietly about their jobs, facing daily the prospect of ordeal by fire or water. On September 10, 1941, two corvettes, Chamblay and Moose Jaw, contacted and sank U-501. This was the Royal Canadian Navy's first kill. Other ships would soon join the exalted ranks of the sub-killers. Saint Chilliwack, Battleford, and Napanee. Assiniboy, St. Croix, Oakville, Wetaskiwin, and Skeena. They tracked down the enemy with ASDIC and radar and blasted him above and below the water with gunfire and depth charges. No longer could the members of the RCNVR be considered amateur seamen. Reserve officers from every walk of life across the country were now to be found serving in every capacity beside the experienced men of the RCN and the RCN Reserve. Recruits came from every ethnic grouping, every social and economic class. Some of the Navy's finest seamen came from the prairie regions, men who before their service had never known salt water. Life at sea came as an experience for which they were completely unprepared but they were determined and adaptable. That almost overnight, a nation of landlubbers could be converted into a seagoing power was one of the most remarkable achievements of the war. the price to be paid for victory at sea, the grim six-year battle of the Atlantic claimed the lives of 1,797 Canadian seamen. Torpedoed, mined, bombed, lost in collision, the ships died too. The tough young crews of the motor torpedo boats learned to accept death as an inevitable companion on their nighttime thrusts into the enemy's coastal defenses. the losses, the fight went on. As the war progressed, the advantage slowly shifted to the Allied cause. The Navy began to think less in purely defensive terms, and the growing significance of the aircraft carrier added a new dimension to the Navy's offense at sea. Offensive sweeps of the Royal Canadian Navy now took them into distant waters, the Bay of Biscay, 
the Norway coast. The Murmansk run. In the forefront of this offensive were the tribal class destroyers. The tribals were designed not for convoy escort, but to sweep the enemy from the seas once the Atlantic battle had been won. Once control of the air and sea had been wrested from the enemy, the way was open for a decisive blow at the mainland. On June the 5th, 1944, Operation Neptune, the marine phase of the invasion, began. Sixteen Canadian minesweepers in company with units of the British Navy approached the coast of France. Theirs was the job of sweeping the invasion path clear of mines. On them depended the safety of hundreds of ships, the lives of thousands of men. Sixth, the invasion fleet set sail. Under Neptune, the Allied navies assumed responsibility for landing the armies of liberation on French soil and for the maintenance of lines of communication and supply. The Canadian Navy was an integral part of this plan. Canada's contribution to Neptune was 110 ships and 10,000 men. defenses gave in grudgingly. But by evening of June 7th, the invasion was considered to have been successfully established. During pre-invasion operations, Athabaskan was lost. And before victory was to come, Regina, Alberni, and Trentonian were sacrificed to the long and grinding process of supplying the armies in Normandy. Troops crashing into the heart of Germany and the growing refinement of anti-submarine devices like the Hedgehog, time was running out for the once arrogant U-boat fleet. During the war, Canadian ships had accounted for 29 submarines. But the undersea raiders were a threat until the very end. the six years of war, a force of 2,000 men had grown to 90,000. Where there had been only six destroyers were now nearly 400 fighting ships. On April 3, 1945, the Honorable Angus L. MacDonald paid this tribute. Our men have fought on every sea of the world. Soon they will come back, those who are left. Back over the great oceans where their laurels and honors have been gathered. 
They will come back to knit up the raveled skein of their lives. And some of them will dwell far from that element which was once their home and their battleground. Yet I venture to say that so long as memory lasts, the recollection of these great days will be with them. And along with the consciousness of duty done, they will carry in their hearts forever the image of a gallant ship and the spell of the great sea. <laughs>